Hey everyone, thanks for checking out this retrospective. Today we are covering the Vita for 2017. This is my first Vita retrospective as I go through last year's releases, but I plan on going back to the previous years and catching up at some point soon. If you haven't seen any of my retrospectives, I like to go through a console's library. This time I'm doing the Vita in 2017, like I said, and I started doing this as a way for me to kind of keep track of my own collection, find out what games I want to keep in my collection that I have and what games I want to add to it. And I like to do these videos alongside that to share with other people who may be interested in these console libraries. So the Vita had a pretty interesting year. We're really starting to see some drop off in the different kinds of genres that are coming out for it. Still doing pretty well digitally, including tons of indie titles and the stuff that people really love the Vita for. But, you know, physical releases have really slowed down to just JRPGs and visual novels. So, so let's get to the physical stuff, which is what I usually like to cover in these retrospectives. I usually stick to exclusive stuff up front, but a lot of these games also came out on the PS4. And if they're more notable here, I'll mention them here. Eventually, I'll get to a multi-platform video for the year where I go through everything that came out for multiple systems. But yeah, for now, I'm just focusing on the exclusive Vita stuff that came out last year. Starting off with Atelier Shell plus Alchemists of the Dusk Sea. This is the 16th game in the series and the third and last game in the Dusk subseries. This game takes place 10 years after the previous game and has the player pick one of two characters to play as. The game features bigger fields and more harvestable items to do alchemy mixing. This plus version of the PS3 game introduces two new playable characters. I think this Vita version was only available through the NIS America online store. But for fans of that series, which I don't know too much about, it seems like it's definitely worth checking out. Next up was Tokaiden 2. This is Omega Force's Monster Hunter clone that also came out on other consoles, but the original started on the Vita, so it deserves a mention here. This game takes place two years after the original and has the player in control of a character who was unconscious for the events of that game. The player's character is a slayer who uses a demon hand weapon to take down the Oni that are devastating the world. The demon hand can also hook onto items and enemies. Gameplay features more of an open world and more seamless battle transitions, and overall it's a decent take on the Monster Hunter genre, especially since we didn't really get a good Monster Hunter game on the Vita. Next up a game I should have here, but actually I have it for both 3DS and PS4, so I don't have a Vita version. That is Zero Escape The Nonary Games. This is a combination of the first two games in the Zero Escape series, including 999, 9 Persons, Hours and Doors, something like that, and Virtue's Last Reward. These are both prequels to Zero Escape, Zero Time Dilemma, and that's the last game in the series to come out and definitely worth checking out. It's a great visual novel slash room escape adventure game series that has a really interesting sci-fi story. Definitely worth checking out and you need to start here because you have to play these games in order to really get the story. Next up, a game that I think was only available on the NIS online store as well physically, that is A Rose in the Twilight. This is a gothic 2D puzzle game that stars a girl trapped in a castle without color or time. Teaming with a sleeping giant, she can absorb blood and use it to restore color and time to elements in the castle in order to solve puzzles and progress. It's just a really cool looking 2D game. Also just worth a quick mention for JRPG fans because I prefer to play it on the PS4 but Akiba's Beat also came out on Vita. That's an RPG that takes place in Akihabara that's a follow up to the Akiba's Trip games. Moving on to our first visual novel of the year, Hakuoki Kyoto Wins. So this is the first of two games that remake the original Otome visual novel which was released in various forms on the PSP, 3DS and PS3. Hakuoki is probably the biggest Otome visual novel series out over here, we've just had a ton of entries compared to other series. It takes place in Japan's past and features a girl searching for her lost father who was working on a life enhancing potion. She meets up and forms a relationship with several soldiers from the special police force who help her along the way and like I said it's the first half of a remake so gonna be followed up in 2018 with another game. Moving on to Operation Babel New Tokyo Legacy. This is the sequel to Operation Abyss New Tokyo Legacy. It's a first person dungeon crawler with turn based combat. The game features an all new story but has the characters from the first game return. You can now also assign a second blood code to your character which is kind of like giving them a second job with a different set of abilities to learn for more customization. Next up is Yuta Waromano Mask of Deception. <laughs> This is a sequel to a Japanese only PC and PS2 game. It's a fantasy themed visual novel with RPG tactics battles built in. The game has the player controlling an amnesic protagonist who wakes up being the last pure human in a world full of people with animal ears and tails. Basically an excuse to have dog girls, cat girls, bird girls, etc. The original game never came out over here but it did have a dubbed anime so you could watch that if you're interested in catching up in this story but it's not really necessary. Mask of Deception is only the first part of this sequel, but fans didn't have to wait long for the follow-up. The tactics battles have timed button presses like a Super Mario RPG thing, and attacks to let the player get multiple hits in. 
God Wars Future Past is next, which is a tactics RPG released on both the PS4 and Vita, with a story made up from myths from the 8th century Japan folklore. The game has a job system with over 30 jobs to customize your party. Next up is Tokyo Xanadu. The return of the Xanadu series moves the setting to a more modern era. The game is an action RPG that takes place in an apocalyptic future Tokyo, where the main character and his friends are sucked into a vortex dungeon world. The player must explore the dungeon and find out how to close it off. This game seems kind of like a riff on Persona. You go into a dungeon, but in the daytime you kind of meet up with your friends and, and gain more skills by being more social with them. Which brings us after all that to the first game I have on this table, and the first uh, Otome visual novel that I tried. I know Michelle was really into Hakyoki, but I could never really get into them, but Caller X Malice is one I tried to get into. And I haven't finished it yet, but it is one I'm still going through uh, to see if I like this genre or not. The stories are interesting, but yeah, let's get into Caller X Malice, which is a visual novel where you play a girl who's been outfitted with an explosive collar by a terrorist group. Together with a group of misfit detectives, you must investigate the group responsible for your collar and the other terrorist attacks. So an interesting story, the romance stuff as far as I've played take kind of a backseat, which I think is common for Otome games, but uh, yeah, I just really wanted to check out the genre of theirs because the game stories do tend to sound really interesting and I do want to check out more of them, but I need to know if it's something I'm into first. That brings us to Undertale. So this was an I Am 8-Bit Online exclusive, with pre-orders announced at E3 and the Vita version releasing alongside the PS4 version in both regular and collector's editions. This is the first console release of the PC hit indie RPG that's been heavily inspired by Earthbound and lets you play through the entire game without killing a thing. This was huge. I know Nintendo wanted this on the Wii U and couldn't make it happen and it's just it's such a beloved indie RPG that everyone needs to check out. I got the PS4 version. Uh, I don't think it's still available. Uh, probably super rare if it's not still available but if it is I highly recommend you go out and get a copy. If not at least download it because it is a great game worth playing. And that brings us to Ute War Romano Mask of Truth. So like I said, people didn't have to wait too long, about three months for this follow-up to Mask of Deception. It is very similar, another visual novel with turn-based battles that picks up right where the last game leaves off. It has a slightly updated battle system, and the game finishes the story from the previous game. Which brings us to the next game I have in my collection, one so crazy in concept I couldn't help but grab it. That is Drive Girls. This is an action game starring transforming girls who turn into cars to race and battle. The game features two types of levels, some which are racing challenges and others which are action stages, where you have to move through the level and take out hives of enemies. In the action levels you can freely transform, whether you're in girl or car mode determines the kind of attacks you can perform, and it's just so crazy, you know it's like magical girls but also transformers, it's something definitely worth checking out. Next up, another game I have on the PS4, but definitely worth a mention on the Vita. That is East 8 Lacromensa of Dana. This latest East game is also coming out to Switch soon, and it's definitely worth checking out, but it's worth mentioning here because the East series has had such a prominent placement on Vita and PSP. A lot of those games have come out here that haven't come out elsewhere, so definitely worth mentioning. Getting to another game in my collection, an RPG that just looked so cool I couldn't pass it up, Mary Skelter Nightmares. This is an interesting turn-based RPG that takes place in an apocalyptic world where humans are ruled by creatures called the Marchen, who jail the humans and perform experiments on them. The game stars a cast of characters taken from fairy tales with the protagonist Jack helping a group of basically magical girls starring Alice in Red Riding Hood. The game has the player exploring the jail as a series of first-person maze dungeons similar to Etrian Odyssey, and in the turn-based battles attacking an enemy fills up that character's blood gauge, which can be used to unleash powerful attacks and other abilities. This thing is really worthwhile for its style. It is a cool gothic fairy tale take on Etrian Odyssey, and definitely one of my favorites among those kinds of games. Next up, another game that came out on the PS4, but I'll always play this series on the Vita mostly. That is Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony. This game follows the first two games, the Danganronpa 3 anime series, and the Ultra Despair Girl side story. But actually, given the new cast, I think anyone could jump right into this one without playing the rest. And you'd still get a lot out of it. You'd have some of the plot points spoiled from the previous games, but if you don't want to wait, this is one that you can just dive right into and enjoy it on its own. It introduces a new cast of characters trapped in Hope's Peak Academy, and has all the social interaction, investigation, and class trials the series is known for. It also has more shocks, I think, than the previous games, and is a must-play for fans of the series. Next up, another Otome visual novel that I have my eye on, Bad Apple Wars. In this game, the player controls a female character who, after a car crash, finds herself in the afterlife as part of a spiritual academy. The player has the choice to take sides on an ongoing battle between the rebels and the school enforcers. The plot revolves around a forbidden apple hidden in the school that the rules forbid students from touching. 
but the rebels believe it will grant them life again, so they're trying to grab it. As the main character Rinka, you must choose a side and discover the mysteries of the school. Next up is the visual novel Chaos Child. I prefer to play visual novels on the Vita, so even though this did come out on PS4, I'd rather play it on a portable system. This is the fourth game in 5PB's Science Adventure Visual Novel series, which includes Stein's Gate. The game is a thematic sequel that takes place six years after Chaos Head, a visual novel that was never released over here, but you could have seen the anime adaptation that was. An interesting setup in this visual novel is that it forces the player to play through the main narrative before the secondary routes are unlocked. During each playthrough, you can still choose how to respond to specific points, and that changes your relationship to characters and the ending. After that, a follow-up to, I think, a Vita exclusive, Yoma Wamari Midnight Shadows. The second Yoma Wari game, released on both PS4 and Vita, following Vita's Yoma Wari Light Alone. Like the original game, this is a 2D horror adventure game where the player controls two girls who are separated and trapped in a haunted town. Overall, a great story and a great atmosphere for a 2D narrative horror game. Definitely worth checking out for horror fans. I have this one on the PS4 as well, but I recommend playing it here if you'd prefer to play it on a portable. Next up is Summon Knight 6, the latest game in the Summon Knight series, which was released for PS4 and Vita through Gaijin Works. This game is a tactics RPG with visual novel segments. I haven't checked out this series yet, but I think I need to. I know I have one of the imports that I'm going to check out as a Let's Play sometime, but this latest entry in the series has callbacks to all the previous Summon Knights games, so although so few of them came out in English, uh, and most of that stuff would be lost on us, I think it's still kind of cool to know. Um, the plot surrounds three characters who live in isolation on an island, when suddenly characters from previous Summon Knight games start falling from the sky. Next up is Demon Gaze 2, a follow-up to the original Vita exclusive that was released in November on both the Vita and the PS4, but like I said, the original version was only available on the Vita, so this is probably where I'd play it if I had played that original version. The game is a first-person dungeon-crawling RPG with turn-based combat and social elements that let you build relationships with other characters and eventually even date your party members. Demon Gaze 2 has the player as part of a rebel group fighting against a demon gazer who has used his power to brainwash the city's citizens. Over the course of the game, the player can recruit 16 demons, which unlike the first game, can also be used to form their party. The last interesting game for the year, I wouldn't call it a good game, but definitely an interesting notable one, Tokyo Tattoo Girls, an exclusive strategy game that sounds way cooler than it actually is. The game takes place in an apocalyptic Tokyo, which has been split up into 23 wards where the survivors have been trapped and where certain people have been granted magical powers through their tattoos. The game has the player and his female companion trying to take over the 23 wards, after which they'll be able to escape the isolated city. You can add to your abilities by giving your partner new tattoos, which is where the Tattoo Girls sync come in. Gameplay is mostly about managing your resources and using your abilities. There's no action or real combat gameplay. Really the gameplay is just about choosing menus, deciding where to attack, and then going in and tattooing your girl. It's an interesting theme and setting, but it's really only for hardcore fans of sims like Romancing of the Three Kingdoms who are looking for something a bit simpler and different. And that's it for all of the notable exclusives for 2017. If you've probably heard that car production is stopping at the end of next year for physical games, so collectors like me will have to put up with that. Um, it is kind of a shame because like I went through, there's still a fair amount of games coming out for the Vita physically. I didn't mention all of them, obviously. I just mentioned the ones that I think really are notable. But granted, there was still at least one a month, and Limited Run put out a bunch of stuff that I didn't mention because it was limited. Um, I think it's a shame that this is probably going to be the last big year for Vita stuff, but, you know, that's just how it goes. So thanks for checking out this episode. Uh, subscribe and check out all my other retrospectives, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.